So I think we should begin. Okay. We have people coming in from all over, more people coming in. So hi and welcome to the people who have just arrived. Uh, I'm Steve Rogenstein from the Ambizadors, and I'm going to be your guide today, your host and moderator. Uh, and maybe you're somewhere else and it's morning or it's the evening. So welcome and thanks for coming. Uh, we would love to know where you're located. So if you can type in the chat where you are. I'm Steve in Berlin, because it's nice to see where people are. Sweden, Berlin, more Sweden. I know we have a couple of people who are live in Berlin, but from other places around the world, Scotland. So we're thrilled that you're joining us today for Honeybees and Hope in the Anthropocene. This has been a collaborative effort between the Ambizadors, Mellifera Berlin, and Apis Arborea. Uh, and the three of us, me, Mikhail, and Heinz, are going to give a couple of introductory remarks uh, before the panelists begin their presentations. And the reason to do this is just to contextualize why we're here and what we hope to accomplish together. So to begin, uh, we wanted to connect. We wanted to connect the three of us because we've never worked together as a Troika. However, each of us has worked independently together. Me and Heinz on the Learning from the Bees conference in 2019 in Berlin. Me and Mikael in the Bees, Dreams and Medicine speaker series. And then Mikael and Heinz together as members of the Tree Beekeeping International Group. We also wanted to connect speakers from different backgrounds, uh, different sectors and different perspectives because we were interested in seeing what would result when we mix them together. So there's a Zeidler, for those of you who don't speak German, that's a tree beekeeper. Uh, we have a Zeidler, we have a conservationist, we have an artist, and we have a Buddhist rewilder of bees. And it sounds like the beginning of a stupid joke, but that's actually who we have assembled to, uh, today. And we wanted to connect you, bee lovers and people around the world, uh, around this topic, honeybees and hope in the anthrop Anthropocene, uh, whereby we wouldn't uh, dwell on the doom and the gloom, but we would actually try to share inspirational and optimistic uh, stories with you in hopes to spark your imagination, maybe new thinking, and possibly even action. So this is our aim. Uh, Heinz, did you wanna say some introductory remarks? Yes, please. Hello everybody, I'm Heinz Risser, and I'm here because I come from conventional beekeeping and my father was a conventional beekeeper. And I learned organic beekeeping. And I'm in love with tree beekeeping and in Germany called Zeitlerei. And I still ask myself if that is enough to do to help the bees. So the honeybee is still on intensive care and in, actually in hospital. And I want to give them a voice. And as Greta Thunberg said at the World Economic Summit, I want you to panic. I'm not panicking currently, but I want to do something with the event. And Steve, as you said, to connect everybody, to listen to the bees. Thank you. Steve? And Michael? Sure. Um, I would like to welcome everybody as well. Um, it is an, it's such a deep pleasure and a gift we can give each other uh, together to set aside some time in our busy lives. Um, I would like to invite us to honor all living beings where we right now are individually, past, present and future. And I had this question, or we probably all are united in this question of how did this all come together? What vision brought us together? 
and is there an intention we are following, each of us in our own individual ways? What is it that wants to move us right now? What are the voices in a time of crisis, the voices that's, that seek vision and future? A research symposium, a round table, a gathering of hearts and minds, a space and time to wander, and a moment in our life to also let us dream into bewilderment. And it is an opportunity to listen to the, this is beautiful German word to lauschen, to deeply sense, to deeply sense into a lifeness and beinghood, a space, a space and a space to explore the relationship and relevance between humans and honeybees, or shall we call them apiens instead of honeybees? That's how I like to refer to them as apiens. As we have entered a new geological epoch that reveals culture as a force of nature, the Anthropocene, the Anthropocene. And it also is, the, our gathering is also a space for storytelling. A storytelling outside the box. A storytelling that reimagines who we are. And I wanted to quote something Laurie Anderson, many of us probably know Laurie Anderson, a quote of her, um, she got interviewed, she has a new exhibition at the Hirschhorn Museum. Um, and there she says, now many of our stories no longer make any sense, but so far nothing has replaced them. We are in a story limbo. And for a storyteller, this is an intensely interesting place to be. So this gathering is an extreme, intensely interesting place to be. And I want to finish with the word hope is in the title of our event today. Hope as a feeling of trust and one that is experienced by many who live with the APN and one that is experienced in very, very subtle ways. This, this trust and sometimes it, we can experience it as an unrevocable sense of confidence. That's my attempt to describe this feeling. Those of us who live within the field of the, of the Apian recognize and have experienced. And that's just an attempt to put it in words as an unrevocable sense of confidence emanating from the Apians. And this may be then be a good leaping off point for us to continue. Thank you. Thank you, Mikhail. Thank you, Heinz. So that uh, now we're all on the same page for what the vision is for today. Uh, I am going to start our presentation with a couple of logistics. Uh, first, the format for today, the first hour are presentations. Each of the speakers has about 15 minutes to talk. And then this will be followed by a panel discussion. Now yeah. we're going to begin with our panelists. Uh, you've already met him, but not officially. We're going to start with Heinz Riese. 
Uh, and I'm just going to read a quick bio. Uh, Heinz is a tree beekeeper and co-founder of the Melifera Regional Group Berlin and a founding board member of Tree Beekeeping International. He teaches beginners in organic, bee-centric, natural beekeeping, as well as arboreal apiculture and traditional tree climbing techniques. He's the Melifera Regional Group Leader in Berlin and co-produced the second Learning from the Bees conference. So Heinz, do you wanna take the screen abilities? Yes, so should I start with my presentation? Yes, please. And you have 15 minutes. All right. Do you need me to stop first or do you just take over? Um, I'll stop mine and you can start with yours. Okay. Uh, Steve, do you want to talk about the that we are recording? Oh, and that was the last thing I needed to say was we're recording this. So if you don't want to be visible, you can turn your camera off. But hopefully that's not a problem for anybody. Okay, so you should see my, my screen. Yes, we do. Steve? Excellent. So... Okay, honeybees and help in the Anthropocene. I'm a beekeeper and I'm a Zeitler and I made up my mind to, uh, to fill this with some slides which might be interested for, interesting for you. And the first slide is, hold on. So the first slide is this one. I'm far away now, 200 years from now. What would aliens find on Earth? And what would they find humans at all? Would they find honeybees? So I would like to make you think about for the, the year 2221. And what they would find probably is atomic waste. You all know this, that we are producing lots of atomic waste and we don't know where to store it. And they probably will find human bodies, but in coffins with liquid nitrogen, frozen to be woken up. So as we all know, all rich people who believed in future solutions to extend life. And by the way, it doesn't work with frozen chicken to defrost. And in my opinion, it will not work with humans because the brain is made of water. And if you freeze water, it will expand. What they will find is, what they definitely find is poison soil. So the difference between a living soil and a dead pile of dirt is glyphosate. And they would probably find not only glyphosate, they would find neonicotics, maybe corona masks and lots of electronic smartphones and artificial material, which is all over the world. So the question here again is, are there any humans honeybees, or even nature left. This is quite scary for me. And I ask myself, if, will this really happen? So let's look at nature on the next slide. During Learning from the Bees 2019, the conference we had with Thomas Seeley, we put the honeybee in focus. And we asked the honeybee, hey, honeybee, how are you? But when asking this to the bees, we should also ask the beekeeper, hey, beekeeper, how are you? Because he has to deal with Connolly loss treatments against Varroa and so on. And we need to ask agriculture. So they have the same crops, monocultures, and a very challenging environment. And we need to ask the farmer. They have certain yield, they have growth, they have low prices to deal with. And we need to ask the forest, or the forest, further on the forest, where always the same trees, monocultures, water shortages during drought, droughts. And so the forest status report show that in certain areas, four or five trees are sick. And then we need to ask the forester, and this is a very popular forester in Germany, Peter Wollin, 
and he needs to deal with sick trees and the harvested wood goes to China. What a crazy world. I would probably need to ask the Varroa as well, as I'm a beekeeper. And the Varroa would tell us, well, I suffer because of phonic and oxalic acid. So in total, we need to ask, hey, nature, how are you? And during the conference, we tried to find out some answers on it. We haven't found it yet. Instead, we found some facts which I would like to share with you. So this is the current situation with nature. That's serious stuff. So these are threats for humans and for honeybees, viruses. And humans, we, yes, we have the coronavirus and we have vaccination against it. But for honeybees, well, caused by the varroa mite, we have the fondling virus, to name just one virus. And we have just the, uh, yeah, we have treatments because we don't have any other things uh, to kill this, to kill this varroa mite so that it doesn't come to the fondling virus. But what if this virus will be transferred to, hu to humans as the coronavirus did? And it's good that I don't have wings. So let's focus more on insects and at the factors they are facing because they're caused by humans. And as a beekeeper, I'm interested in statistics. And this is what I found. If you look at the problems at a whole, these are the percentages which are basically produced by humans to insects. So intensive agriculture, of course, that's on top. Pesticides come second. Fertilizers, forest clearance, and so on. We all know this. But there is another big percentage, which is fires, global warming, and river regulation. So basically, we are losing biodiversity. And let's look at the big percentage of the global warming or should I better say global heating, because it's global heating and not warming. And I, I ask myself, which of us is able to adapt to temperature increase? Humans or honeybees? Or another question, who will survive if we are messing up the environment? By the way, this is a picture of Dresden in 2019. So I will leave you with that question. This is a picture from Berlin Brandenburg. It's not Sahara, it's Berlin Brandenburg. And it's scary. And this shows, and I guess it was in 2020, shows that it's, it's drought, it's food shortage. And for humans, this is no problem. We will find food via globalization, but where do insects find food? And no insects, no pollination, and no food for, for us, no food for humans. And this is called shifting baseline. A new generation will grow up with, with this. But I, myself, I had different times with, for example, house martins and lots of insects on my screen of the car. And this is happening right now. Let's look at the global warming again. How hot can it get? And I don't want to dig into this picture in detail. It's just extreme weather right now. And it's, for example, it's unstable food supply with one degree. It's heat waves and floods and droughts with 1.5 degree. And although in Germany, all, we already had 42 degrees Celsius environment temperatures in summer. I would like to look at the body temperatures of humans and honeybees. And Steve, I, I'm still alive, right? My internet is still alive because I yes. don't hear any feedback. Okay, good. Yeah, we hear you. Good. All right. So, 
the human temperature is 37.5 degrees and it can raise, raise up to 42 degrees centigrade. But there is a big difference. So humans need to keep their 37.5 degrees and we are not able to survive over 42 degrees, at not, not at least at, uh, at mammals. So this is at 42 degrees, we are dead. So we need to keep the temperature quite stable. And with honeybees, it's the same. So they keep their brood nest temperature to about 35.5 degrees centigrade, very close to human temperature. And honeybees can heat up their flight muscles and increase their temperature to kill wasps and hornets. And it's my assumption that honeybees are better in adapting to temperature increase and as a community, as a bee community, than humans. So this is tree beekeeping. This is like the rye. And as tree beekeepers, we try to find better natural environment for honeybees than we have seen in the previous slides. So we can do it with lock hives, we put high up in the tree, or even with live trees, living trees. And I ask myself, are these safer places for honeybees? And the only way to answer this question are findings so far, which will come on the next slide. So I try to answer this question by comparing tree beekeeping versus conventional beekeeping. And it's a totally different approach of beekeeping. It's extensive, it's Darwinian, it's sustainable beekeeping with less stress for bees. But we don't have much experience. We've just started. 2003 in Poland, 2014 in Germany, where I started in Steigerwald, and due to this less experience, we have, of course, we have losses. We have lots of losses, especially in Steigerwald in Germany. That's an area in south of, of Germany. And we had very bad experience and we're making progress. We're working with the same species of honeybees as the conventional beekeeper does. We have the same industrial agriculture and industrial forests and monocultures all around us. We are fighting predators from, in forests who steal the honey of the bees, except bears. And we have yeah, food shortages in summer. And here in Berlin, we have three years of drought in a row, 2018, 2019 and 2020. We're still fighting neonicotics and glyphosate. So where's the hope then? I like to give you some hope. So the hope is, this is encouraging. Honeybees and so col honeybee colonies and scout bees, they find these empty cavities in trees and log hive when swarming. So on the left-hand side, there's a nice live video where a colony which is searching for a new home got into this lock hive. And some honeybees survive in trees and lock hive without treatment. And if you follow Professor Thomas Seeley in Arnold Forest and his conferences and his books, then you will know why. And last but not least, biodiversity in forest and agriculture will change. In Germany, there are different approaches to plant locally based trees, fruit trees, linden trees. And I think that's the key to have food for bees and, and insects. And from my experience, these honeybees and my lock hives, and I have five of them, they're more calm. And I assume because I do not open them too often. And they always have surprises for me, much more than I have in these magazines, in these boxes we, we beekeepers usually have bees. And this is, by the way, this is not based on material and technology. It's just simple. A wooden trunk and hollow trunk and put bees in it. So as a recommendation on the last slides, 
I would like to reduce environmental stress factors. Environmental stress factors for honeybees and for humans. So for example, yeah, save the planet with natural base solutions instead of belief in technology. What I mean with that is plant lots of trees to reduce the carbon footprint. And during the next 10 years, we'll, it will be decided if human civilization will survive. Full stop. Thank you very much. Steve? Thank you, Heinz. If you could just stop sharing your screen. How do I do that? Uh, okay, got it. Great, thank you. So thank you, Heinz. Uh, what I appreciated in that, amongst many things, is that you're asking the question about bees, about farmers, agriculture, forests, foresters, showing that there is this interconnectivity and there's a need for us to be uh, more nature-based instead of science-based. We have a lot of the answers already at our disposal just looking at nature and hopefully we will look to nature for more of those solutions. So our next panelist is Christoph Heinrich. And I think that this is a great uh, segue because he is the Chief Conservation Officer of World Wildlife Fund in Germany and a member of WWF's executive board. He's responsible for the organization's nature conservation work to preserve biological diversity with a focus on the protection of endangered habitats and species in international priority regions of the tropics and temperate latitudes, as well as in Germany here. As a member of numerous nature conservation organizations, and as a study geographer, he has been active in nature conservation on a voluntary basis since his youth, and he is also a Zeidler. Christoph, you have 15 minutes if you'd like to start. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Steve, for um, for your kind introduction. And um, maybe you you wonder how how it comes that I I have been invited to this seminar as a conservationist. Well, you you mentioned already I um, I uh, I'm doing some sort of a natural bee beekeeping, and I wouldn't call myself a sidler, but in fact. I met Heinz List and Heinz invited me to the seminar. I met him on a seminar where he um, introduced us to tree beekeeping and we were carving a lock hive. So I carved myself a lock hive and I have now um, put it to my garden. I don't have yet bees in it, but um, I, I hope next year I will have bees in my lock hive. Um, let's let's um, share some experiences from conservation, from my conservation um, professional background uh, with you guys. And I will try to make some links to uh, beekeeping and to honeybee protection, if you like. Yeah. First, I would like to start with a rather provocative um, assumption, at least from the point of view of Central European conservation work, we can watch that biodiversity currently is not decreasing, it's increasing, maybe due to climate change. And for those who know more about insects, this might not be too much of, an, uh, of a surprise. Insects do like warmer water, uh, weather, and that's what we, that's what we got. And um, the, the series of very hot, record hot, uh, summers has been mentioned already. We have seen um, a picture slide that looked like a, a desert, a sand desert, but is uh, indeed um, an acre here in, in Brandenburg, the county around Berlin. And those who know more about insects will know that, that these warm, sunny summers are, are, in, are in favor for insects. So many insects are benefiting from it, it while others, those, those species who are adapted to montaneous or even alpine or Arctic habitats 
or those species that are adapted to wetlands, they may suffer. And that's what we see. However, the balance between losing species and gaining species is still positive. So biodiversity, at least in Germany, is increasing. If we only look on the numbers of species, which is not a good indicator, to be very clear. Yeah. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, adapt my conservation strategy on the sheer number of species occurring in a country, but I would rather look on the populations of those species who belong to a regional um, context. And if we ask for what kind of species um, does Germany have an international responsibility to keep them? These are mainly species of temperate forest ecosystems, mainly the beech and oak dominated temperate forests of Europe or um, Eurasia. And if you have a look on those species, the, uh, the, um, the, the, the record of the last years is not very positive indeed. We see that, that many of those species are adapted to rather cold, cold temperate climate, and we see that that they are under pressure. We even see that a lot of our forest trees have come under pressure. So um, a journey to, to Germany and neighbor countries will show you millions, millions, maybe even billions of trees um, suffering from bark beetles, mainly um, the, uh, the spruce tree, but also um, uh, broadleaf trees such as beech, um, the ash tree, the, uh, the elder tree, etc., are suffering either from drought or from germs, bacteria or viruses that are attacking those trees. And all this is a complex um, indication that things are changing in nature. It's not all negative. We see some new tree species occurring, not uh, due to foresters planting them, but they are occurring because they they start a seedling, such as the walnut or the chestnut. It's a phenomenon. If you if you visit a forest in the just in the environment or surrounding of, of Berlin, you will see many, many walnut trees in the forest or um, the yew tree. The yew tree is suddenly occurring everywhere. So is the walnut tree. So what I want to say is, um, if you open your eyes, you will see that nature is reacting on a changed climate. And it comes with positive, or let's say it, it comes with an adapt, kind of adaptation of nature, a reaction of nature that could be considered as a positive um, way of reacting on those changes, but it also comes with a lot of damage. If we have a look on uh, wetland species, um, the, those were suffering a lot because many, many forests that are adapted to, um, to, to a high water ground, ground water table, forests dominated by the elder tree, for instance, which are habitat of crane populations, just to give you one example, um, they are under heavy pressure. And just those days when the cranes are assembling here in resting places near Berlin, some 10,000s are arresting currently. This still might be the past that we are looking at, that, that we are watching. Um, the future of those cranes is quite unsure, much more unsure than those huge flocks of cranes uh, might indicate currently. Maybe this is the population of the past and um, the predictions that the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds has done already in the 1990s, when they were first um, publishing a climate change atlas on European breeding birds, I read that they were predicting the crane to, to um, get extinct in Germany. And I was very surprised of the, about this because the, the crane was doing so well here. Yeah? But they said, no, due to climate change, it might become so dry that the habitats might disappear. And that's what we saw in the last years. The forests with the water forests where, where they are nesting and they need the water, they were all dry many years in a row. Just one example. Good. How is this linked to honeybees? 
honestly, I don't know. I, I wouldn't say that the honeybee or many, many other um, uh, insects, um, wild bee species, for instance, are, are in peril due to um, climate change. So this is not my assumption. It's not even my assumption that we will see a disappearance of forests or of natural honeybee habitats. No, I'm not expecting this. So I don't think that climate change is becoming a major factor or major negative factor for honeybees. Um, I, I still see that intensive land use is a much more important um, factor and uh, um, reason and, um, and, and threat to not only insect populations, but also birds populations, mammals, uh, plant populations, etc. So here, as well as in many other parts of the world, it is intensive land use, but climate change is becoming a factor. Maybe not that much to honeybees, but to ecosystems and other species. It might be quite, or it is quite different, my view on honeybees and climate change when I look beyond the borders of Germany, when I look to um, places, for instance, Latin America, the Amazon basin or the central African forests. Here we are speaking about tipping points, tipping points that might define in the future the occurrence and existence of whole ecosystems. And um, well, I have seen that one of our participants comes from Sao Paulo. So he, he might share with us the experiences Sao Paulo had some years ago with a, with a, with a catastrophic uh, trout in the Eastern Amazon um, basin. Certainly due to um, um, forest clearances and deforestation in the Eastern Amazon basin. And this summer, Brazilian scientists have published um, a study in which they said that the day or the year in which they expect a so-called tipping point means a, an extent, an intensity of forest loss that will change the whole climate of the of the whole Amazon basin to a, in a way that the existence of forest is is in danger at last uh, at, at large extent that this that this tipping point might have come quite 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 near this is a totally different story from anything that i could tell you from europe yeah because this will define global climate and this will define uh, the existence of ecosystems and then certainly also of bees of course and it is quite similar in the central african forests of which we know that they are vul more vulnerable than we might think they look quite stable but they aren't they're not they're not as dense as we think many of those central african congo basin forests are actually quite light they have a very light um, canopy shelter and they are closer to savannas than to what we understand as a, as a rainforest, the dense rainforest. And we know from history that only some thousand years ago, huge parts of the dense rainforest of the Congo Basin used to be a triforest or a savanna forest. So we can understand only by, by looking into history that these ecosystems are not as stable and resilient as they uh, resilient as they look. So they are quite volatile. And um, tipping points in those ecosystems means a loss of forest uh, canopy, a loss of forest shelter might define the climate, the bigger climate of a whole region, and then cause a kind of vicious circle into a negative direction. This is something we have to keep in mind. So is there any hope? Is there anything positive? Yes, of course. And we heard already Heinz mentioned nature-based solutions. That is also my favorite strategy. So uh, applying nature conservation and restoration of ecosystems, not only as a tool to restore and, and protect biodiversity, but also to, um, to capture uh, carbon into ecosystems and uh, to bind and keep it into ecosystems. And there's a lot of work that, that could be done and a lot of positive stories that, that I could share. We don't have the time here, but um, 
just um, to mention that that more than 100 countries um, have signed the so-called bond challenge on the restoration of forests at larger scale. So the, the plan is to restore more than 350 million hectares of forests globally, which is 10 times the area of Germany, for instance, or there are huge undertakings to restore mangrove forests and uh, coastal ecosystems, both um, in order to to capture carbon, but also to protect coastal lines, uh, coastal um, ecosystems, and to protect the yeah the coast against the rising sea level, etc. A lot of wetland restoration, still not enough, of course, but. I think many, many people and even many governments have understood that something has to be done. Um, until this Friday, I was having some, some, some vacation at the um, Baltic Sea coast, and I went on an excursion with, with an engineer from the Coastal Protecting um, Department of, um, yeah, of the German coast, and it was so interesting to, to listen to this guy. The guy wasn't sure whether climate change is really happening, but he was absolutely sure that the sea level is rising much, much, much quicker than he ever thought. And he said what they can measure already is so much more than any study in the past has predicted. And he says, that's just a fact. Yeah, this is not a guess. He said, I'm an engineer. I can measure it. And he said, it is astonishing, astounding how quickly it comes. And he was telling about, um, about the answers of engineers. Of course, the answer of engineer quite often is concrete. Um, we, are, we are working on other strategies. So more smooth and soft coastlines, protection and restoration of um, natural coastal habitats like um, uh, peatlands so that the peat and the and and um, the coastal ecosystems can grow with the water level. Yeah, they cannot if there is a um, if there is a hard structure. They can only grow if sedimentation can take part part and uh, if uh, and this takes area. So I don't want to go too much into detail. Maybe we have some time later in our discussions. I will stop here. Maybe. One one last um, link or word. Oh, this is my this is my timer, and now I don't know how to switch off. Good. So it's exactly precisely fifteen minutes. That's the beeping. Um, climate change and honeybees are honeybees in peril due to climate change. I'm not sure to be honest, and um, but uh, some ecosystems on the planet they are under pressure and this might have impact in those areas on honeybees as well here in europe i'm more optimistic yeah i can only warn us as as bee lovers that we shouldn't be too optimistic that we should not only look on honeybees because honeybees may not be the right indicators other populations other ecosystems are much more in danger than honeybees so we should be ambassadors um, for the broader biodiversity, not only for those honeybees. Yeah, I stop here. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Christoph. And that's actually a really great point because a lot of people are pointing to the bees or honeybees specifically and saying that, uh, you know, they're dying all over the world, but, you know, you can split them and the numbers might be deceiving because, you know, we do have the numbers might not show that, but uh, the other species, the solitary bees, the pollinators, et cetera, they do not have the adaptability that honeybees do. And as you're saying, there are lights of hope with all of these plantings of millions and millions of trees and protecting the, the coastline. So thank you to you and WWF for all the work that you do. It's outstanding and we all appreciate it. Uh, so our next speaker, is Anna Prvatsky. I think I might have pronounced that somewhat correctly. Uh, and her bio is, Anna's training and background in music, theater, mask work, architecture, fine art and beekeeping inform a cross-disciplinary practice that ranges from watercolor to video performance and augmented reality. She says that she's committed to making work, quote, as round as the earth, and performances as compressed as water, end quote. She adds that she aims for pedagogical 
meme pollination, and maximum viewer titillation, which sound great to me. Uh, she comes from a line of Slavic beekeepers and is going to give us a presentation today that I am going to queue up for her. So let's, can everybody see the new presentation? Great. Anna, do you want to unmute yourself and? I am unmuted. Oh, fantastic. So just tell me when you need slides advanced and we're going to start your 15 minutes now. Great. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly honored to, to be part of this. And um, I, I'm not a beekeeper. Um, I'm not a scientist. Um, I am an artist. Uh, and I do know and feel that um, science and nature directly inspire my art practice. Um, and of course, my beginning uh, with my grandfather, which is, this image is actually from uh, my grandfather's beekeeping manual. So I should tell you a little bit why bees are, bees are really like a family affair for me. It's um, my great, the story goes that my great, great, great grandmother, when she married my great, 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 great grandfather brought bees as her dowry. So everyone for many generations has been a beekeeper in, in my family. And the last one was my grandfather, who was, as you can tell from his beekeeping manual, uh, a conventional uh, beekeeper. Um, and I was very, very inspired by this formative time in his presence. Uh, I was four when I colored uh, his uh, classic Langstroth uh, beehive pink <laughs> and we will come back to the beehive um, but I just wanted to uh, maybe we can go to the next image um, the role of bees in history and culture is to me really really fascinating for one I find that bees have been um, kind of kidnapped by everybody from unions from anarchists to monarchs to unions to computer programmers everybody has something that that resonates uh, when when it comes to conversation about bees. Um, this is uh, an artwork by Bruegel uh, called the Beekeepers uh, from 1500s, and uh, it's an image that I find actually incredibly, still very timely and ominous and and um, very very vivid. Um, and you can also notice the, the, the bird teeth in, up in the tree. Um, but I, I've actually, many of the, the recent documentaries about the plight of the bees have this image uh, as documented in the 21st century. And then we also have the next slide, uh, the more kind of uh, seductive, playful uh, cranache uh, of uh, Cupid and, and Venus and Cupid complaining to Venus about the bees. Um, there's actually the next slide is a detail from from Gemelde Gallery here in in, in Berlin, uh, where where Cupid is is holding the honeycomb, um, and then of course the next slide, uh, Dürer. So bees uh, have been so present in in all the different cultures, in mythologies, in literature, in visual art, in poetry, and. I guess I grew up within this culture and within this background. And then uh, 12 years ago, my grandfather passed away um, about three months after his bees passed away. Uh, I was pregnant at the time and I found out that he left me 500 kilos of honey. And at first I was overwhelmed then I was emotional, then I was so excited. And I thought I would make a great art project out of it. And then I started really doing my research. Um, I mean, growing up with my grandfather, he was not a, a particularly educated person. He was really a farmer uh, and a peasant, peasant, Slavic peasant stock. Uh, and he had a deep relationship with his bees, but he didn't know about what was causing the changes that he was aware of and he was observing these causes. And so 12 years ago, I, I became very passionate about um, you know, learning more about colony collapse disorder and, and all of these things that were affecting bees. So Steve, please, if we can move to the next image. Um, I was commissioned uh, by Bloomberg. Um, uh, I don't know, you're probably familiar with Michael Burr Bloomberg, the ex-mayor of, 
of New York City. He has a, this is his offices at headquarters of Bloomberg and uh, they commissioned uh, a series of art projects. And I thought, okay, this is a good moment for me to test some of the things that I was researching with and thinking about and how to communicate it. And I thought, ah, this could be a good opportunity to make a little Trojan horse and put it inside of the, you know, the mouth of the beast. Um, and I actually convinced Bloomberg's um, team to give me one of these Bloomberg terminals, if we can move to the next um, slide. So how Bloomberg made his fortune is these two screens. If anyone wants to do stock uh, investment, any sort of banking, you need a Bloomberg terminal, which kind of gives you the latest stock options of whatever it is that you're interested in trading. So I convinced them to program it in such a way that on the left you had, uh, on the right you had the latest news about bees, pollination and colony collapse disorder. And on the left you had the latest stock uh, levels um, for anything that had to do with pollination, specifically pollination of the bees. So for example, Driscoli Blueberries, which is a huge US company uh, with a very problematic uh, labor practices, but a, a multi-million dollar company, almonds, of course, wines, and so on, so, so forth. Um, and I made this kind of base, I worked with a local carpenter, and I made this base um, that's kind of an homage to my grandfather who loved to move his bees. So anyone who's a beekeeper, you're familiar with the, with the moving hives. Um, and inside of the drawers were different um, different local honeys uh, and once a week um, and also I should add that this was really placed like the Trojan horse it was placed in this cafe area of the Bloomberg so a lot of the uh, people who work there would go get their tea and then they would see the honey and they would start scrolling through the Bloomberg screens and it became it kind of generated this new conversation inside of Bloomberg about what this was, what this meant. Um, and then we can mo move on to the next slide. Uh, so this is, this was Chris Harp. Uh, he's a beekeeper and an activist from New York City. Uh, he's responsible for making beekeeping uh, in New York City on the rooftops legal. And he would come in once a week and do a honey tasting and speak to the employees about um, the plight of bees, about natural beekeeping, about what what it entailed both in terms of uh, economy and climate, um, what, what, what was going on with the bees. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, Steve, please. Thank you. Uh, so let's move a bit forward because on this topic of hope, uh, I do believe in imagination. I believe in being critical, imaginative, uh, and mischievous. Uh, and I did a project uh, three years ago at the De Young Museum in San Francisco, which had a few elements in it. This was an augmented reality project. And this was a video that was part of my augmented reality experience and a video that you could see inside of their garden. So let's play the video. You will need the audio for this. It's a one and a half minute video. Is it really choppy? We have no sound. Yes, yeah, Steve, maybe you, you might have to replay it and unmute you. And can you hear it now? Yeah. I looked around. OK, sorry. Let me restart that. Oops. Mm. Sorry for the glitch. If you could give me a thumbs up if you can hear it. Allow me to demonstrate my new handmade, homemade, do-it-yourself pollination glove. As the bumblebee nears extinction and colony collapse disorder and deforestation claim more and more bees every day, we must find simple and imaginative ways to support pollination. So I used a gardening glove, but any glove would do. And 
I looked around the house for objects that are small and committed enough to do the job. So we have a tiny doll hand, a multi-handed Ganesh, a group of miniature workers, some bells to announce the pollination, and a feather. Be patient and loving, and feel free to hum the flight of the bumblebee. Pollinate very early in the morning and in dry conditions. Identify the male and female flower. Use the glove to gently swirl around the male flower. Touch all surfaces of the female flower. Collect pollen from multiple male flowers for each female flower on the plant. So of course, this is a kind of a, a fantastical um, proposal. Um, but sometimes that is, I believe, what gives us hope. <laughs> Fantastical proposals. Um, the next slide is maybe a little bit more somber, but it was also part of the, the exhibition at the Day to demonstrate my new um, handmade home. Um, this, uh, this work is titled, the title of this work is called The Bee Memorial, 80 Million Years to the 21st Century. Uh, and it's actually a one-to-one -one replica of my grandfather's beehive, uh, the one that we saw in the first image. Uh, and I worked with uh, a local tombstone grave maker uh, to realize this work. It's a very, very simple uh, piece, very unassuming uh, work, which is kind of nestled inside of the, 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 the young garden. Um, and I think it's quite self-explanatory. I kind of, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tombstone, it's a memorial set in the future. Or perhaps it is the memorial uh, and kind of commemorating the failure of the conventional commercial beekeeping. Um, I think the work um, works either way. <laughs> um, and the thing that was actually to me most interesting making this piece was one that it was absolutely impossible to convince the art institution to allow me to make a bee garden next to it because apparently bees are seen as like a huge uh, insurance threat. Uh, there's a very, very funny legal name for, for them that I forgot. So no art institution, however much they want to champion this kind of work, will let you build a, a bee garden, plant a bee garden inside of the institution. And the next image, Steve, is actually something that happened, which was the relationship to the audience. People started bringing flowers and placing it on the bee memorial. Um, and the, the sculptures start, you know, the people who took care of the grounds also developed a really, really intense relationship to the memorial and started calling it the bee grave. And there was always different flowers placed on top of it. Um, which I found really, really incredibly moving. And uh, just very briefly, the next slide, this is my current project. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, at the moment, the digital artist is in residency at the Gropius Bau Museum in Berlin. And um, I am developing a project called Apis Gropius, uh, which is um, a new species of bees um, and it's a kind of a storytelling technology augmented reality project in which I'm introducing the story of this bee that is a bee of the past and the future. It's a bee that kind of talks about the architecture of the museum. Um, and the story that I, I'm telling is that this bee moved into the whole uh, of the museum after the bombing, after the Second World War bombing, and has since lived in the museum and has been sort of, has co-evolved with the museum. So its wings are like the skylights, um, all of its colors are kind of adapted to the architectural details. Uh, the, the bee, this bee pollinates the architectural details and um, it's kind of also a, a, a critique on, on institutions. Um, anyway, I will end here. I know we have only 15 minutes, but um, this is just a very, very general overview of some of my bee-related projects and just my approach to thinking through all of these questions, both with anxiety and hope and mischief. <laughs> so thank you so much. So thank you, Anna. I love that uh, you bring in this totally unique and creative perspective and work with bees and have this historic 
connection to them and cultural connection and it's really inspiring so thank you for sharing the project. thank you uh, and then our last panelist is Mikhail Joshin Thiele. Uh, Mikhail's pioneering approach to apiculture as a platform for global renewal has appeared in national and international magazines, books, and films. He has presented his work at Harvard University, New York University, and consulted for the uh, United States Department of Agriculture. In 2006, he founded Gaia Bees to advance biodynamic practices in apiculture. Then in 2017, created Apis Arborea, a multidisciplinary approach towards rewilding, conservation, and protection of honeybees. Mikhail pursues apiculture within a sociocultural and spiritual dimension and is an edge walker within the biodynamic and holistic apicultural field. You want to take over the screen? Yes, sure. Thank you very much, Steve. And let me set up here. Okay. And in case people haven't noticed in the chat, Silke has been providing each of the speakers links to their organizations so you can get more information. All right. So um, thank you very much. Um, um, I'm, I'm very grateful uh, that I can be here and that this project took shape in this particular way. And it's very inspiring to hear all the voice, all the voices who came before me and will come after me. Um, it's such a different learning and um, coming together um, with having many disciplines, different disciplines represented. So uh, very inspiring. I originally uh, had planned on a different kind of presentation, but arriving at my hotel, my uh, Wi-Fi speed was too low. I was planning on showing um, a video as a medium besides my voice. So I had to switch a little bit and uh, you will, will be witnessing my switching. <laughs> um, so this is another alternative attempt to give voice to that what connects us to give sense into being and um, what I love about the the diversity within the panel is that we all are able to look um, at the world and at our lives from so many different vantages and in some ways that allows us to create different images um, and also different depth and in witnessing and participating it holds something very precious and I will get to that in a moment. So language and words are elemental and in order to sensitize for other vantages I think we um, we benefit from from being creative with words in particular when it comes to um, what we normally would call honeybees and um, as most of us probably know is the world of honeybees seen from the perspective of the what we call beekeeper uh, is full with words that may say more about the person who invented the words and maybe less about the animal and the being it is trying to describe. So that's why I refer to honey bees as the apian, just as an attempt to move away from the commodity, from this deeply ingrained association of honey. And, and in doing so, we can create space for other kind of perception and so forth. So we come together also to mark a milestone of human presence on Earth and to inquire into a renewed search for identity and being as we feel called towards a story of interbeing, 
a story of symbiosis, of sim being. And I'm, what I'm trying to, um, the vantage I'm trying to share with you is that that apian vantage, that unique wisdom and blueprint that we can witness in the apian world. Finding, we, so we come together also to explore how to find a refuge and um, finding refuge and hope in the presence of the apian of honeybees is often happening through what we call could call presencing and breath oh it's a video but i don't know it may be choppy is that choppy steve yeah okay then i'll skip it um so who are we who are we when we gather and what do we become when we gather just like honeybees just like what we could call a tissue-like gathering of individuals. That that is what the apian being is constituting. This tissue-like gathering of individuals. We may call an in, a so-called individual worker bee, but we so miss the point. There may not be a word, but we can see the function. We can see this merging between polarities. Who are we as tissue-like gathering of individuals? This apian way of transforming the notion of the individual the notion of knowledge and being. What we, we, when we look in onto this phenomenon, what we will see is that what appears to be an individual is, is continuously um, migrating and moving through all different various parts of uh, metabolistic metabolic processes yeah that some tissue is all of a sudden following liver organ functions just to in the next moment be part of the tissue of what Jürgen Tauts calls a social uterus there is there are quantum field qualities within this being that is sometimes beyond our comprehension. I would like to share a poem to this. One that is was is by Rumi and called a great wagon. Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there's a field. I will meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas language, even the phrase each other does not make any sense anymore. The breeze at dawn has secrets to tell you. Don't go back to sleep. You must ask 
how we can heal don't go back to sleep people are going back and forth across the door sill where the two worlds touch the door is round and open don't go back to sleep and then that so that's the poem by Rumi and it it is so we maybe could say apianesque there's this apian way of of speaking almost this apian way of being that Rumi expressed in in this poem and I wonder this don't go don't fall asleep don't go back to sleep I wonder whether that is what we can also hear the apians trying to say to tell us don't go go don't go back to sleep but we may not hear that with our ears but with other organs we have and I'm sharing this little animated image with you because it illustrates this one really critical point we are at in history and that is this white one could say this white beam of linearity that has propelled humankind throughout the millennia all the way to up to this point to today this white beam of of rationality of mechanics this white beam of of mechanical beekeeping of a of a in mechanics in general that is the foundation and the causation of the anthropocene and here we have now this like laurie anderson said this super interesting moment in time for a storyteller when the old stories lost their validity this white beam of light hitting the surface of that prism and now it is becoming a rainbow what is revealed is that the singularity that this single belief system that brought us here is not capable of describing reality and not only that but it that it induces suffering and the apian cosmology the the what this apian phenomenon constitutes one could say is that rainbow in this illustrated in this animated image and that is also this the this opportunity for humankind to listen and to diversify our own way of seeing and being and of living I have to see where I am here. How much time do I have left, Steve? You have about two minutes. All right. Um, well, let's let me jump to the very end of what I wanted to say. Uh, and that has to do with still this image, this um, diversifying our perception and in in doing so also diversifying who we think we are and diversifying who we feel how we feel we belong as a non other and I want to share with you um, something that is called two eyed seeing this it's a principle of a native people and the word they give it i can only try to pronounce and i will fail and it's called it 
Etwam Monk. And it's translated as two-eyed seeing. It is the concept of bringing different knowledge systems together to increase our collective breed and depth of understanding. Learning to see from one eye with a with the strength of indigenous knowledge of whatever the perspective is, and from the other eye with the strength of Western knowledges in all its diversity. And learning to use both these eyes together for the benefit of all. And here a circle comes to a closure when then we, we witness the Apian in its fundamental pliability, in its fundamental um, vow to give it all for the sake of their, them, their themselves, but also all life gestures and expression of service. Innumerable plant species depend on what we call pollination so the, the act of eating is already a service. And I think with, without any exception, the Apian is an embodiment for those values. And therefore, there's so much to learn uh, from them for us. And maybe I'll leave it there. Thank you, Mikhail. Can you please? Yes, thank you. Uh, so I love the idea of two-eyed seeing and bringing the perspective of the indigenous or one perspective, and then the other of, let's say, Western society or modern society, because we could also apply that right now to our panel discussion, because we're going to have these perspectives of conservationists and an artist and two arboreal apiculturists with different perspectives. And the purpose of the panel is to spark dialogue. So instead of asking a question for one of you to answer specifically, I'm going to ask or try to ask broad questions that any of you could really jump in to uh, respond to. And if you have a dissenting voice or you have an agreement, by all means, please share that. Uh, so I'm gonna start with a question that's sort of pointed at Anna, but not exactly. Um, and let's see. So Anna, you're an artist. You're working with many media and across many subjects. How do you see art and creativity interacting with other fields like science and conservation. And then conversely for the other panelists, what value do you place in unexpected fields like art to inject new ideas into and advance your areas of study or work or the conversation about the Anthropocene and or conservation? Thank you, Steve, that's a really, Great question. It's actually a question that's very dear to my heart. And um, I also feel very uh, fortunate and excited to be in Germany and in Berlin because I have been for many years a huge fan of, of course, Alexander von Humboldt. And he was he wrote a lot about the relationship between science and art and how actually art can help us understand science and the wonders of nature. And um, I believe he dedicated his book to, to, to Goethe and his poetry um, and this kind of image of the arts unveiling science. So I do find so much inspiration and, and, and entertainment in learning about nature. Um, so, it is something that completely and absolutely informs my, my work. I hope that answers my questions. Absolutely. And does anybody else have uh, some comments specifically about art brought into the conversation or other areas? Well, um, Listening to your question, Steve, it I I immediately wondered 
um, about uh, whether there's anything that is not art. Um, I also, um, another thing what coming to, to mind is um, how um, the, 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 there's a new, there's a new kind of tendency of different discipline to merge and to talk to each other. And that goes so far as to some um, and uh, environmentalists to say that um, any 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 act or project of conservation has to start with ritual and ceremony. And um, just to give it one more illustration illustration to that, and that is when Christoph when Christoph spoke about biodiversity, I think what this points to is not only to count the different species and uh, to quantify, but then at the same time um, integrate questions of sentience and agency and sapience of flora and fauna of the other than human. And so there we have now the art and the ceremonial uh, and the scientific, um, and 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 it's always and the art the art seem this mm, melting pot or this alchemical um, agent that is able to bring them all together. I leave it there. May I, may I also refer to your um, question, Steve? Yes, of course, please. <laughs> yeah, so uh, my question would be what importance or what, what contribution could art have to conservation? And I think it, it, is, it can be, could be, and it is huge because the rationale for conservation cannot only be a scientific one. Because if it was only scientific, we would always end up with the question, what is it what we are protecting? And the only answer would be at the end of the day, either a status quo, which cannot be because you cannot stop a status, or you, you, you cannot conserve and protect a status quo of biodiversity, um, in a certain time of history, that's impossible. So we have to protect a status quo plus processes, hence evolution. But if evolution is the rational for conservation, then, then it could become cynical or quite relaxed view on it because evolution will always happen. I mean, mankind cannot, um, um, cannot destroy the the planet to an extent that that just nothing survives. And if only a, a slime of bacteria would survive, we would see another evolution. And it would take some hundreds of millions of years, but the whole beauty of the of the planet would be back. So this cannot be the rationale for conservation. Conservation has to be value based. It it has to be based on ethics. Some may also say on religious aspects, so however you define it. And for this, and in order to make this clearer, arts can be, can be an ideal messenger and ambassador because many people understand facts or um, objects, objects such as nature better if they are being interpreted by artists. So the interpretation of nature and conservation by artists. Hence the translation into cultural values helps a lot of people understand better what conservation stands for. So this was a bit long, this was a bit complicated. I think we all may feel that, that so many photographers, photographers or, or painters or others have, have done amazing work in interpreting nature and opened our eyes and opened our senses for nature. 
So uh, I wouldn't underestimate this at all. I think that is really, really important for our species to understand how beautiful nature really is and how important it is to protect it. Thank you. Heinz, you had your hand up and Anna, I see that you want to say something also. Yes. <clears throat> I think there's too much trust in technology and methods and all these material. And we try to solve our problems with the bees with material and te technology we have created ourselves. So therefore I find it a good way that there is, actually there is too less art to make people aware that science and technology and methods are not only problem solvers. So art can point us in different directions. And therefore I'm glad that Anna is with us. <laughs> so thank you. Um, if I can just add, uh, I, 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 I'm, I really, Christoph, I also really uh, got very excited about the way you were talking about the role of art in conservation. I think also what's amazing to me personally about art and very liberating, and which also makes it seductive and it makes it speak to people, is that it's not about politics. So it appeals to maybe our unconscious and, and that sense of, of, of wonder and excitement. Um, and I think that that's a very uh, important tool perhaps that we can use <laughs> to give us hope. Thank you. There are so many points in all of your comments that are perfect segues to some of the other questions that I have. So it's gonna be hard to, to pick which one. Um, but speaking about the politics, for instance, so governments have, have been convening for decades and decades from Rio to Kyoto, Paris, Copenhagen, you see next Glasgow at the end of the month. And after seeing very me little measurable progress, personally, I'm not convinced that politicians have the solutions. So to me, it's a lot of lip service and not enough action. So I posit to the panel, where do you think real advances are being made and will be made in tackling climate crisis? Heinz? Yes, so we have, since 1972, we have this, this Club of Rome, and this was called uh, Limits of growth are limits to growth and politicians haven't listened to that these were scientists and they warned us with lots of with lots of uh, things what will happen in the future and they are quite right so i'm surprised that they are quite right was there was no smartphone available there were not all all these techniques we have to, today and I'm wondering why politicians are not listening to this. And therefore, I, I just leave it open. It's a, it's a question mark for me, why politicians have no, no sense of that it's really it's the earth. And uh, so it's, it's happening right now. And it's not something in the future in 2070. And, and we've just had the election here in Germany and I'm really astonished that people still believe that we can step out of coal and all these mass burning uh, things in the ground in, at a later point in time and not stop it now, which all affects us, which, which increases the carbon footprint and so on. So I don't know what is the answer to this question. Maybe, yeah, maybe Christoph. Well, I can, I can only warn us, speaking about the politicians, um, I, I know many of them, and in fact, some of them are quite ignorant and quite reluctant in, in learning and understanding, but many have understood, and some of them are real experts on climate change. It's amazing how many, um, how many knowledge there is available, and po many politicians have really understood. Their question back to us as citizens is, why don't you guys then vote the, the right ones or elect the right ones, right? It is, I think it's a hen and egg thing. Um, 
those those many good politicians who have understood and who do know how the solution should be they are also left in in, in a kind of um, despair because they they know exactly if they did the right things no one would re-elect them or they wouldn't have the support from society so um, it is also the way how society reacts on measures that politicians undertake that is then encouraging or disencouraging them to go in the right direction. And we all deserve in our countries the politicians we have elected for, right? So um, the quality of a government is also kind of mirror of the society. So blaming the politicians in general doesn't help at all. They are in every country, they're good ones and they're bad ones. And we have to take care without within our societies that the society as a whole um, takes more responsibility and, and stands up more and isn't, isn't disencouraging the ones who really want to, want to make the right decisions. Um, look, we have, a, we have some good examples in Germany, but we have also some really ridiculously bad bad examples here. Just the, the speed limit on, on our autobahn is one of these examples of craziness. Yeah. Uh, I've just learned last week that that only what was it, Syria and 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 Northern Korea and Germany, these are the three countries that don't have a general um, speed limit on the autobahn. Yeah. So we are in a good neighborhood with North Korea. And <laughs> that's certainly not the place we would like to see us. But if a politician here really came up with the with the suggestion to um, to introduce a speed limit, we all know how the reaction from society is and from media. So blaming politicians doesn't help. That's my message back. Bl or blame the right ones. That's my point. Blame the right ones and make a huge difference and encourage the good ones. Really encourage them, um, because. If people always encourage the politicians, then the good ones will be disencouraged as well. Mikael, Anna, any thoughts? Um, you want to go, Anna? Um, well, I it makes me wonder we fall it's so it's so tempting to fall in this dichotomy of them and us someone up there in bonn or whatever or berlin these days sorry oh my god um and this dichotomy does something and i hope that it does not prevent us all of us to act but what is it that makes us act. And for example, youth, right, much younger uh, uh, human beings, they why are they on on the streets? Why are they propelling this, the, this a much stronger urgency? Because I think it's visceral for them in a different way. And it's age dependent. So there is so that's that. And then there is human inertia. Um, and how to break cycles and how to do that in a creative way. And I want to talk, talk just for a moment about arboreal apiculture. It is a major disruptor. Just through biomimicry, that is the, the force. It's biomimicry in conjunction with ethics christoph you talked about ethics and ethics will um, reveal not only the shortcomings of the previous or the conventional system but also the suffering that is induced by it and that in that way arboreal apiculture has become a force and a, and a tremendous disruptor. So wherever our niche is, we can f um, support those disruptive 
discoveries and um, knowledges it's a knowledge and allow and give this more, more a big a larger field i'll leave it there um i would just add quickly that i think you know to go back to the previous conversation when, when i was talking during my presentation about how I find it so fascinating that bees have been kind of kidnapped by every political uh, kind of left, right, center, um, corporations, everybody. And I think that that's, that's so interesting that we can, everybody seems to be able to see ourselves, so to, to see themselves in the bees, which in a way means that the bee is a kind of incredible vehicle for seeing ourselves. Now, what I want to say about this question of politics is that change is incredibly difficult. It's difficult on a personal level. It's so difficult to change and people are so frightened of it. And the change that we, we need at the moment is kind of beyond all of that. It's this collective intelligence change. And that, I mean, if it's terrifying just on a personal level or within relationship, you see how change is threatening to people. To imagine this kind of change uh, on this scale is, I think, paralyzing to many. But I do really like to think that I'm fascinated by the fact that, you know, now I know, for example, in, in, in Eastern Europe, in the Balkans, there is a lot of extremely progressive, uh, almost anarchist beekeepers, and then you have these far right nationalist beekeepers. How is that possible? And what can we really like how to how to channel this in a way that you know in, in, in within this context of climate change? So it's not really an answer, just a question, more questions. Yeah. Um, what I just want to emphasizes that we are maybe going to hold the Q&A session, but I don't see any questions in the chat room yet. So if you do have questions, put them there. If you don't, we're going to continue with the Q&A, or rather the panel discussion. Uh, and the next question is pertaining to the status quo and radical ideas and people individually and collectively changing or being forced to change. Uh, there is a movement called degrowth, and for those of you who don't know about it, it's criticizing capitalistic policies and practices that define success with economic growth and greater productivity. And it almost seems as if that is the radicalness that we need right now is to not have politicians, you know, looking to be reelected or economic, economic systems that just want to grow and grow and grow because we can't grow that much more. So I asked the panelists, what are your thoughts about this? And do you think that there are concrete solutions that are you know, gonna shift the paradigms? Do you, are you hopeful? Do you participate in that? What do you think? Or maybe there are no thoughts. <laughs> no, there is. Uh, there, there are thoughts, uh, Steve. Um, I mean, as I said in my in my previous statement, um, if you are a politician and you want to convince your voters or the population of a county or of a country, then you have to pack it in the right way. You have to 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 send the right messages good narrative, narrative that resonates with people. And I'm not sure whether the narrative of degrowth is one that resonates with people. Because degrowth sounds like shrinking, shrinking doesn't sound very healthy, it's not very positive. It's not, it's not a very, how can you say, spicy, hot message, you know? I think the problem starts with the word. Um, and one of the few politicians, high level politicians, who took it up the concept of degrowth was, and this was a huge surprise to me, it was Nicolas Sarkozy 10 or 15 years ago. 
In fact, it wasn't Sarkozy who came up with this concept. I think just some month he spoke about it and then he stopped it because no one listened to him. Um, I stop here. I think, of course, we know there are limits, limits of resources, limits of the planet, etc. That's 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 almost banal. But we have to find a better way to to frame the concept better than degrowth. Yeah. Um, I have to say, I really agree with you, Christoph. And I think that one thing that changes is fashion. Uh, and, and fashion is something that appeals to people, that speaks to people. And what is in fashion now? Maybe not so much radical change, but virtue signaling, for example, is in fashion. I don't know if you're familiar with this wonderful term. Virtue signaling is uh, the term that some cultural historian came up with, which is signaling your virtue on social media, saying that you support um, rewilding, you support Black Lives Matter, you support trans uh, communities. So you signal your virtues, you signal your morals. This is fashionable at the moment. I don't know if people are really, really acting on it, if they're really practicing this in their lives or they're just signaling it, but maybe, I don't know, fake it till you make it. <laughs> but I do agree that, that this kind of seductiveness of, and, and the language and the kind of, you know, I was, I was part of a European Union conversation between artists and policymakers, and the question came up of how to make Europe sexy again. And it always boils down to like, oh, how to make something really serious and horrible or something that has to like be changed. Like, oh, how to, how to make it spicy, how to make it appealing. So I think it's kind of interesting because it's, it, can be, it can be very, yeah, it kind of goes back to the Trojan horse in a way and, and subversion, uh, but with, with, um, with good intentions. <laughs> So I think that's what, what we perhaps need to look at and exploit this need uh, for fashion, but also sort of kind of find hope and energy in, in I think what this new generations are really, really pushing for. Heinz, I see your hand is up. Yes. Uh... My comment on this is that the climate zones are shifting. And this means for the animal and for the plant world that flowering times no longer fit the life cycle of the pollinators. And this will have a, a heavy effect on growth, economic growth. And if we don't find alternatives, and modern honey is a good example where where people climb trees to pollinate trees, this is not effective. It's not that effective as honeybees can do it or other insects. Yeah. I would, yeah. I think um, I agree with everything you said. And what I could add is um, that as long as we don't question the premise on which we have been operating for the last few thousand years, as long as that ancient operating system, as long as that illusionary thinking of oneself and others, as long as that is still not addressed, I don't believe in, in um, a chance for fundamental change. Because this has been the driver, this really alienation between oneself as a human and the rest of the world. It culminated in the thinking of mechanics, plants and other non-human uh, life forms uh, are, mm, are non-sentient. And that um, we believe that we can, we, or we, we think 
we are completely independent from anything around us. When the truth is um, that within the last century, not only indigenous cultures knew that already forever, and not only uh, in certain kind of spiritual traditions were pointing to this all the time, but also science. I mean, contemporary Cartesian science is now um, exploring the, a definition of life that goes beyond what we took as an individual. But this, there's a new thinking evolving, a thinking in, in terms of systems, a thinking in terms of interdependencies. S Michael does not exist, right? I'm a part of the entire biosphere and there is no other either because what we call other is co-constituting who I am is, who I am, who I are. So I think, and then I'll just make a link to bees. There are so many places we can go from here. Going back to the being in the presence of what we call honeybees. And they touch us. No matter what our political orientation is, they touch us, whether we like it or not. And what they touch is they touch our heart. And they open hearts as if they want to, I'm going back to the very beginning of today, uh, as if there's this beckoning calling us um, into this inquiry of the very dusty premise on which we still operate. So, and I'll leave it there. It's just packed <laughs> with so much thought and so many different tangents we could go on the indigenous communities that are suing governments and corporations and actually winning against mining and pollution and all these. There's that whole movement, especially in the law world, where you are representing animals and other sentient beings and even non-sentient beings like rivers and uh, mountains and forests and you know, giving them voice, giving them rights so that they can't be kept in zoos or, you know, basically cut for extraction purposes. So I'm seeing a lot of uh, positivity. And what I'd like to do is end the panel discussion with a quick question for each of the panelists, uh, because we're running out of time. But the question is, what advice do you give people today to get more deeply connected to nature and or involved in these movements to counter the climate crisis? So Heinz, you're from, muted. Yes, so from my point of view, try to listen to the bees and they will tell us something and even if we don't believe that they are telling us something I would like to encourage everybody to start listening to them because they are really ambassadors of what is happening right now and due to a whole life cycle of the year so my experience with the bees is very much different from the years when I was a beekeeper with my father when I nine when I was nine years old, that has changed drastically, and that is of that's worrying me. It's I'm really scared of and to and to uh, repeat Greta Thunberg, I want you to panic, and this is really I'm panicking. I'm I'm really panicking because this is just incredible what is happening right now listen to the bees please i agree i think we have to listen to the bees 
But I think that we have also shown that as a human species, we're really bad at it. We're actually kind of kind of good at talking. So I would like to propose that you try and listen, but also try and talk in the old tradition of telling it to the bees. I think maybe if we hear ourselves tell the bees what the situation is, if we tell, if we hear ourselves tell the bees and nature in general, the facts, um, the panic will intensify, which I think perhaps um, that, that's what we need to act. So listen, talk, whatever it takes. Thank you, Anna. Christoph. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, uh, I think um, climate change, coming to your question, climate change is very much better understood in our societies than the loss of biodiversity is. Why is that? I think it's simple. Uh, even people living in, in, in towns who are absolutely deconnected from nature, even those people are still connected to climate, to weather. And they can see, they can experience a change in climate. Everyone can, everyone who's older than I think 20 or 30 years will have some personal experience with a change in climate. And if he or she hasn't a personal experience, you can take it from the media. So that's, I think, quite well understood. Maybe not, still not enough, but here I'm optimistic. And I think our connection to the changing climate is closer than our connection is to nature. We are incredibly deconnected from nature. I mean, we, we know from, from a couple of studies that people have just known many, many, not everybody, but many, and we're speaking about majority of, of 80 to 90% who have almost no knowledge about nature. They don't know a single bird species, not even a blackbird is being identified. People don't know what we call in Germany, Amsel, blackbird. They don't know what an Amsel is. If you ask school students, how many tree species they know, I still thought at least they should know an oak tree because it has such a significant leaf. But no, they don't know the oak tree. Many of them just know zero trees. So our, and I mean, many people have no knowledge and no, no understanding, no imagination how their food is being produced, etc., etc. So I don't want to complain too much. And I don't want to be too pessimistic, but I want to, to, to say it is a difference between understanding climate change and understanding the other big crisis, maybe the bigger crisis, the loss of biodiversity. And my fear is that our deconnection from nature is much harder to be restored or regained into a connection of nature than, than our connectivity to climate. That's a long way to go because it has to it has a lot to do with getting in contact with nature. And since we are living in a world that is becoming more and more um, a rural world rather than, um, no, an urban world rather than a rural world, um, even in developing countries, many people don't see nature at all. Um, today, the average African school child school student has a lesser chance of seeing an elephant than the average European school student might have. Just think about this. Even in those countries, the deconnection from nature is increasing. So on a planet with a, with a hor horrific <laughs> loss of knowledge about uh, knowledge in the broader society, not the scientific knowledge, the, our scientific knowledge about nature is almost exploding. We know so much more about nature than even 10 years ago, but it, this is not a broad knowledge. It's not grounded and rooted in society. Here we are getting deconnected and that's what concerns me a lot because I, I still think only if people understand nature, they can love nature. 
And only if they love nature, they, they will want to protect it. And here bees come in. Um, to me, it was so surprising to see that this study released, I think five years ago, about the decline of um, insects, insect biomass in German protected areas released by a group of, um, of scientists from Krefeld. This was such a shock to the German public. And it turned out that insects rather than birds or, or mammals um, were the ideal ambassadors for people to understand what's really going on. And what we know for, for certain is that bees, honeybees, are probably the best ambassadors among all animals or all, uh, <laughs> all biodiversity out to explain what's going on in nature. Um, I can just tell you, and I, I won't for the sake of time, how my neighbors reacted when I started beekeeping. Um, I, I took from the from all the good beekeepers books that first you have to, to go to your neighbors because they might be angry about your beekeeping. No, no, they are all amazed. They laugh me for, for keeping bees. Yeah, I stop here. Um, we need those ambassadors. Honeybees are perfect ambassadors, but we have to tell the right story. We must not tell that honeybees are going to be extinct because they aren't. They are not even in danger. No, but we have to, to use them to tell the real story. It's, it's about the wild bees. Yeah, It's about the entirety of the insect uh, populations out there that is, that is in peril, et cetera, et cetera. You all know this as well as I do or even better. But um, these ambassadors are very valuable because this is one species that, that people still know. It's the honeybee. Although quite often they think that West, ah, no, I won't tell you this. Is, I stop so, here. Thank you. Thank you, Christoph. So we've actually reached our time, but we have some more things to say. So if you'd like to continue and join us, we're going to go about five or seven minutes over. Uh, Mikhail, would you have something to say about uh, pieces of advice? Well, I wouldn't, I'm not sure whether it would be <laughs> advice, but um, first of all, what I want to say is how inspiring it is to listen to everybody and to come together because it makes me, and hopefully it's true for everybody, it, it allows other thinking, other awarenesses to come into our, um, into, yeah, into our life. And um, in regards to the question, by the way, thank you for all those wonderful questions, Steve. Um, I wanted to say, I want to start here. And that is that what came up for me is a very, very simple practice an ancient practice which is extremely powerful and can be practiced anywhere at any time whether you're riding the bus or you're on, on the top of a mountain and that is a simple question and that question is who am I? Who am I? And to ask oneself that question over and over again and let it sink in and you may have immediate answers and you may also reach a moment where that answer is shifting dramatically or there may be times where there is no answer anymore there may be even a time when there's not even anyone left who asks a question but what i'm trying to say is the power in that practice is instant and anywhere we are, anywhere we breathe. And then that reminded me of one more, one other practice, and that is that to, of practicing gratefulness. That like one of um, a dear friend of mine, Brother David Steindlerust, a Benedictine mon monk, he practices that. Um, and he says, this is not just another day today. This is not another day. This is the day I live. And this is the one breath I take. And to be grateful for this gift that has been given to all of us. And in turn, to ask us what 
can we do to protect this gift? And it just shifts our thinking, our feeling, our awareness. So I guess, Steve, you could say my advice is um, that of gratefulness and to ask what the hell I am. <laughs> Thank you. And actually, during the first Learning from the Bees conference, I participated in an activity that you led where you had us sit and ask that exact question in front of somebody for two minutes. And it was powerful. So from firsthand experience, when you're asking yourself, who am I? It's, it can go to a very deep place. So unfortunately, we've run out of time. Uh, I would like to thank all the panelists for your contributions, for your stories, for your insights. Uh, I'd like to thank our team for participating and helping Ilona, Ingmar, Silke, uh, and thank all of you for coming and sitting here, listening to our speakers and hopefully processing this, reflecting and maybe acting locally where you are. Uh, and because of your contributions and because we decided to do this uh, on Zoom, we are actually going to donate the proceeds to three organizations. And I'm just going to quickly share my screen with uh, Hamburger Forst, which is a group of activists that are camping out in forests and have been for years uh, to stop developers from stripping them for lignite. There's the hunger strike 2021. And these people are, I think, on a 28 day hunger strike to affect change in government, uh, specifically here in Germany, about climate change. And Piece of Land is a beautiful garden, an educational garden here in Berlin that is under threat of development that Silke is involved in. And we wanted to contribute some funds towards their uh, defense of the property. And with that, I would like to turn the stage over to Mikhail and Anna for a closing ceremony. Well, actually, we talked a lot about storytelling. Um, and, I, and I'm so grateful to be part of this new group of friends and to be part of this conversation um, and to actually acknowledge the importance of storytelling and to, to meet uh, Michal today or, or a few days uh, ago for the first time. We started talking and of course I started telling him about my great, 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 great grandmother. And um, hey, mother, Shh. sorry, I'm talking about my great, great grandmother and my mother's right here being really, really rowdy. Um, Anyway, and then I was telling Mihail about this DNA testing and how, you know, the first sapient mother, the great, 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 18,000 generations, the first human mother. And then Mihail started telling me about the Apians and we together came up with a new idea. And that is the... That is that... Um we like to play with words um, because as you all know language shapes perception and vice versa and so we were talking about um, the sapiens we talked about homo sapiens and in conjunction with the apiens and we thought what is the relevance and the connection and then we came up with homo, homo apiens apian. <laughs> <laughs> so we ask you to imagine this kind of exciting possibility of human evolution and consciousness that maybe we're not just descendants from the apes in the past but maybe descendants of the bees in the future and perhaps changing our physio physiognomy and our consciousness into this apian way could be one way of hope. 
so that we would rise further up, you know, as we have been rising from the earth and the homo, the homo apian then would maybe grow those wing-like structures and allow us to propel ourselves in different ways. Uh, we always also were wondering about uh, what other phys physical features we may have in the future as Homo apian. And we thought about a very large heart that maybe we would be just hard. And, and really uh, large genitals as well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> to facilitate pollination <laughs> only um, and um, besides that um, we also knew that uh, we had a very deep sense for two-eyed sensing that it would not only be two-eyed sensing but as we all know homo apian has compound eyes and it probably will be million eyed uh, uh, seeing and not only two eyed seeing. So our dear fellow Homo Apians, it has been a great pleasure sharing the last two hours with all of you. Thank you. And watch out next time you're in, in the forest, you may, you may, you may see a Hopo, Homo Apian <laughs> flying around. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, uh, guests. Hopefully, we will see you in the future with more of these types of discussions.